Good afternoon, everybody, and, and welcome to another Explore More Sundown session. This uh, evening, or late afternoon, it gives me great pleasure to introduce Audrey Marais, who's the CEO of Crystal House in Cape Town. Um, Audrey, welcome, and thank you so much for joining me this, uh, this afternoon. Thank you. Hi, pleasure. Cool. So um, just to give everybody a little background, uh, Crystal House is a, is a school based in Ottery, which is uh, sort of southern suburbs in Cape Town. Um, I was lucky enough to, to be introduced to Crystal House through a contact of ours when we were looking at bringing a Canadian school out on a, on a trip, um, which has subsequently been uh, postponed, but we'll get them out here as soon as we can. So um, before I go on too much, I think Audrey, maybe you can give me a, a little idea of, of what Crystal House is all about and, and maybe explain to people, it's, it's obviously a, not a normal school, and, and you know, how do you go about um, you know, bringing your kids into the school, yeah. what, how do they qualify, etc. So I think what's interesting you said it's not a normal school and I immediately wanted to say, yes it is. So Oops. it's a normal school in the sense that it's a school, you know, yes. building bells that ring, kiddies who run left, right and center, um, then they get grade R and grade 8 and grade 12. In that sense, it's a normal school. Um, in, in the way that it's an extraordinary school is that we only recruit from Cape Town's poorest areas. And in the recruitment, we don't particularly look for talent. We just look for humans you know we've learned in South Africa that we're awash with talent people just need an opportunity and a chance mm. so we serve these areas and then when our students come to us uh, you did say we're in Ottery which is in the southern suburbs and I think most people will say well geographically that's probably true but it is the Cape Flats it's the poor areas yes. that macro is that's where all the industrial areas um, and that's certainly not where the leafy suburbs is and where the Constantia ladies do their shopping that you can be sure of <laughs> Um, yes. So we have beautiful premises in, in Ottery mm. and we, we bus our students in. So essentially, if you look at um, really impoverished townships um, like Manenberg, Hanover Park, Langa, Philippi, Delft, where we recruit our students from, we look within those communities at the poorest of the poor. So every single one of our children live and survive on less than one and a half thousand rand per person per month. Um, wow. Go and do your bride shopping uh, tonight. After the sundown, you'll see how quickly one and a half thousand rand goes. Um, that's what our children live on per month. So they're the is that per is that per person or per household? Per person per month. Yeah. Wow. So if a household has got a mommy and an auntie and two gogos and three other people, mm. uh, in, that's eight, you know. So then you multiply that by by one and a half. Mostly the reality is people live on less and often on, on the grandmother's grant or the disability yes. grant or the child grant. So really it's the poorest of the poor. We then say to ourselves, how can we create a school where all the proxies of privilege are? One often thinks privilege is to do with money, but it often is not. It has to do with what is available and, um, and how you think about stuff. So one thing about a good school is you've got to go there, right? Mm -hmm. so measure attendance and we bus our kids in and we take them home because safety is important um, and when you if you go if you look at a privileged child his mommy drops him off we've got a bus uh, mommy packs him a sandwich we get breakfast lunch and two snacks uh, mommy also washes his clothes so we get full uniform satchels books pens pencils etc when our children do sport they get that equipment so you've got to enable learning and you can't start learning if you're not washed, your teeth are brushed, you've got a full stomach, you've got to be able to see on the whiteboard. So we've got two nurses that does the normal health testing, um, glasses, ear, etc. Sure. You've got to be able to hear. So for example, last year, I think we, we had did our, our, our hearing test. And I think 25% of our kids had sick in educationally impaired hearing loss. So we lost. What's happening? And we, we figured it all out, and it turns out it was impacted wax. Wow. Now, I can't learn. He's distracted in class, he's naughty, he's not learning, and you think it's a behavioral problem, but it wasn't. He couldn't see. It wasn't. He perhaps couldn't hear well. It wasn't. Because, for, for various reasons, your, your learning is impaired. 
So there's, there's um, nutritional aspects, there's health aspects, there's hearing and sight aspects. We try and deal with all of that. Then there could be dysfunction in the home. So we have psychologists and we've got social workers to, to help our children with the trauma of daily life. Um, and again, to try and, and eliminate the barriers to learning, even before you get to learning. Um, and then in our schools and in our classrooms, Rooms, I think three of the things that stand out. I'm still happy that I ramble a bit because you did ask. Yes, me please. No, it's all interesting because I, I, my brain is just ticking over because it's how, how education has changed already. I mean, when I was in, in yeah. primary school in the mid 80s, I mean, there's no ways that just because I wasn't listening or concentrating, the teacher or the, the educators might have gone, well, maybe he's maybe he can't hear, you know, or maybe you can't see properly because you, you yeah. were just maybe a naughty kid. Not getting exactly. it, so it's Maybe amazing how it's all changed. Yeah. Maybe you've got a hungry. sore stomach because your parents were fighting again. Yeah. <laughs> you know? Amazing. Maybe you're not thinking because yesterday your mom gave you a hiding. I'm going to say that in, in polite language. Yes. All manner <laughs> of things. You've got to enable the learning. So if you know an enabled learning space, within the learning space, I think three things are important. Um, the normality of, of quality learning. So your teachers have to be educated, and qualified, etc. And in our impoverished schools, that's not the case. But then we do two really, really important differentiating things. The one is that the language in the classroom, mm. the two threads that go through the curriculum, the one is a, a, a thread of career. Mm -hmm. We go to school so that we're able to hold ourselves in an economic space. That's why we go to school. There's no yes. other, otherwise we're wasting our time. Yep. And everywhere, right throughout the first industrial re revolution forward, you were taught things that you will need to be able to partake in the economy. That's why we go to school. So that hasn't changed. And that's why the fourth industrial revolution education is important. But the concept of a career, if you're an impoverished child, is important so that you can know there is an economy to step into. And whatever that means, we, we hold the kid. The other language is a language of character. So you know, or some of your listeners who are, 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 are watching at the moment, you will know when you go to the office that you don't get along with Johnny because he's fabulous on Excel. You get along with Johnny because you get along with Johnny. Mm. He's cool. Um, he hasn't got a thin skin. He can collaborate. He can talk to you about his problems. He can dialogue. He's not always fighting. He's not undermining. You know, that's the stuff that makes the difference. And character holds that. Um, one's respect, your integrity, all of those sort of values. So we thread that through the curriculum, not just in school, but in our, in our staff meetings as well. And then at the back end of that, we hold our parents. So we require our parents to come and do 40 hours of volunteering a year. And then we do a, a, lots of parental workshops with them because you can only, you can't hold the kid if you can't hold the parent who holds the community. And that's that sort of village raises a child thing. It makes sense because if you're doing all the hard work with the with the child at the end of the day, and but he's not getting the support from the parents, then you just you just lose yeah. him. So yes, and that's great that you're getting together. him in. Yeah. Mm. So forty hours a year. I mean, it doesn't sound like a lot. You get parents doing more than that because they get. I, I suppose people are super thankful to have their kids at the school. So do you get people donating a lot of time? Yeah. So there's both. Um, the reality is that is, which sometimes I think when people are privileged think about people of poverty, they think they're different. <laughs> they are different, they just have less money. So the kids are all brought in, they don't want to come to school and sometimes they're lazy and they don't want to study less than that one. Um, in terms of the volunteering, many, many parents are, are doing so much more. That is true. But there are also parents who can't do that because they have a job. Yeah. And you might think, my goodness, they have a job, why are they so poor? But if there are 10 people living in your home and you clean a lady's house and you earn 4,000 a month for that, it doesn't go very far if you have to support nine people. Um, yeah. so some of our parents are employed, they then can't, can't do those hours, but they then ask an, uh, an auntie or an uncle or a gogo to come and do uh, those hours. Yeah, okay. there's yeah. full stories there. Yeah, yeah I think you know, South Africa, for people who are overseas, obviously uh, you, you may not realize, but South Africa has a large amount of, of people that are living on the breadline and sometimes below the breadline. Um, and yes, we've taken massive steps in the last 20 odd years, but there are still people that aren't getting educate, education. 
And yeah. that's something that definitely needs to change. And yes, it has changed for the better, but um, you know, without education, mm -hmm. uh, you know, our future is, is quite dire. So what, what you mm -hmm. are doing and what Crystal House is doing is, is so very important um, because mm -hmm. you're giving education to people that actually can't afford it. Uh, or and maybe they can afford a small amount, but they can't afford the full amount of, of education. Yeah, and interestingly enough, we've just finished, uh, we're just in the process of finishing a, a sort of a quality mm -hmm. study where we looked underneath the hood, as it were. And um, it, some of the parents were saying exactly that, is that maybe if they did go to another under-resourced school and paid 50 or 100 rand a month, mm -hmm. but the breathing space of A, getting a quality education, and then being able to do to, to just breathe and so we find that very often by the time our kids uh, reach high school the parents are starting to get employment because we then also hold our kids from a trek another five years we don't pay for all of that but we hold them for another five years through college and careers placing at university helping them get bursaries etc so it's a long journey an 18 year journey with us at crystal house yeah. So in other words, you have a lot of kids, uh, very much a, a parental figure at Crystal House. It must be amazing. I tell you, and it's been, it's been a lifetime of that, yeah. You have to think of that as, so it's, it's challenging a little bit because you do talk of that as being a parental figure, but you need to be careful to have those boundaries as well so that you can have that in the right, in the right way, yeah. And everything is a conversation, you know, you think, is it no, it's not parental. Are we a family? Aren't we a family? Um, and that's what makes for the good conversations. And, and your background was it? Was it a teaching background, or were you from the corporate world? Yeah, uh, corporate world. Yeah, yeah. but I, and it's it's really everything. So in a way, there's a there's a threefold space. I mean, my original sorry, no problem. Um, no problem. original studies etc was in, in, in sciences so, so I studied biochemistry and that's where that started um, okay. and I think to, to a large degree that formed my, my sort of rational thinking the way that I problem solve the way that I look at the world in that way but I was always drawn to, to social transformation and education is the place for that so where that sort of triangulated I, I, I just found a place that I think I can add some value on trying to add some value. Uh, awesome. Um, so I had a little a little read before we um, before we logged on, and obviously this year, unfortunately, you you lost uh, Crystal Dehan, who, who was the founder of of Crystal House, and um, what an incredible woman! Um, I mean, eight schools, it's six or eight schools globally. Eight, yeah. Eight, and you know, over six thousand kids uh, a day that are, are getting educated in these schools. I mean, it's just an incredible mm -hmm. story. Um, yeah. And uh, quite sad to hear of her of her passing, but you know I'm sure she she must have got a lot out of seeing how these schools have grown and all the kids that that have been helped over the last fifteen years. Is it? I can't 20. remember what. So is it twenty years? Know, so I think it is quite it's incredible. Worth, it's certainly worth pausing on on what she's really achieved. So she, uh, Crystal Khan, is the person who founded RCI, RCI is the, the uh, timeshare industry where you exchange mm. the point. She's Mrs. Point Exchange. And not only did she make uh, uh, created wealth that she was philanthropic about, but there are very few people who actually take that phil philanthropy and do it themselves. People donate money for us and then we're grateful to it. Um, but she out their sleeves rolled out so she put both her, her, her wealth in as well as her time and her expertise for 20 years after she retired until she wow. passed away literally a month ago so it, it really is a phenomenal story that's awesome wow and are the schools going to continue to be looked after by uh, i suppose she has yeah, a trust in, or foundation in typical yeah in typical yeah. crystals um, fashion she was uh, um, born in germany and, and just after the war went to america so she's a very very uh, that precision, compassion, balance that she had perfect, but in her, in her typical sort of German way, um, if it's right to be, uh, what is the word when you, stereotypical is the word I'm looking for, yeah, yeah. everything is sorted, her will, <laughs> what the funeral must be like, exactly yeah. what the legacy of Crystal House should be like. So we're very, very blessed that the legacy goes on. Um, and what she has done, which I think is really visionary, 
her endowment can cover the administrative, the GNA costs of the organization. So nobody wants to pay my salary and the fundraiser salary and the marketing, branding, trademark costs. Everybody wants yeah. to pay the kids and their food and their uniforms. Yes. Covers that GNA costs in perpetuity, the foundation. And the balance, the, the sort of 75% that's left, we, we then need to raise from our own country and our own communities. Cool. Um, so yeah, let's go, let's go back to the school. So uh, you, you offer education from grade R to matric, uh, which is grade 12. Um, how many kids are in, in the, the Cape Town school? So after grade 12, I just want to put that little pin in there, there's another five years that we support the kids. But grade R to grade 12 at the moment is, is just under 750. We've got a capacity for about uh, 800, but it's sitting on about 750 at the moment. So as you said before, then kids are offered uh, transport to and from the school and they get breakfast, lunch and two lunch, snacks. Two snacks. Yeah. yeah, so that's amazing. And then obviously all the, the education facilities, um, you name it, it's all included. Um, yeah. 2020, I mean, yeah. Add, if I can just add to that, one, one yeah. of the things we are, one of the things that make us successful is that, and I know people are horrified when they, were, when they hear it's run like a business, but it is a business. Mm. If you've got money coming in and money going out and you've got income statement, balance sheets, governance, BE certificates, teachers, say certificates, you're a business and yeah. you've got goals. You can't spend all this money on educating children and not knowing if we're successful. So we're very, very, very good at setting out our goals and then measuring that we meet them. So we do the systemic test to see how we compare to other schools. And we outperform this, the, the quintile five schools. Um, so the math and English systemic test, we look at our pass rate, number of people with bachelor's passes, um, attendance of teachers, attendance of the students, every aspect um, gets measured. How many people get immunized, uh, immunized, how many, what percentage of kids are underweight, you know, it never stops so that we can know that our, our eye remains on the goal. I mean, the figures are, are impressive. I mean, ninety percent grade twelve pass rate. Um, I thought ninety nine was it ninety nine percent. Ninety nine. And your, and your <laughs> then your book's wrong. <laughs> no, ninety. So ninety nine percent, ninety nine, ninety five percent year to year retention rate from grade R to twelve, and that's yeah. really high considering yeah, what I the think. kids have to go through. I think that's that's really awesome. Um, yeah, the national stat there is thirty seven out of a hundred. Wow, I mean that's incredibly low. Yeah, oh, yeah, yeah. So I mean the stats are fantastic, and, and obviously your educators are doing an incredible job. Um, mm. But to, to also go back to the costs, I mean for people who don't know, I think your your booklet has has really broken it down so well. And you know I, I was looking at some of the costs, and I can't believe it, but it it all adds up. You know, I mean sixty three thousand rand per learner per year, and that's what you need to raise to get these kids through. And, and then yeah. when you start breaking it down, I actually couldn't believe it. Like four, just under 5,000 Rand on nutrition a year. And I just thought to myself, that doesn't sound like a I lot. Like, that how, in do you, month, how, yeah. how do you, how do you actually make that work um, on a yearly basis? And, you know, under a thousand Rand for sports and extramural, that's, that's really nothing. So it might sound yeah. like, yes, 63,000 per learner is a lot, but actually it's, it's really not. Um, and that's 5,000 rand a month, you know, so yeah. that's not, um, yeah, it really, if you put it in 5,000 rand a month and you look at what you pay for your own kid, wherever they're going, then you realize, and this is everything, this is the busing, the clothes, the uniforms, absolutely everything, all the food, um, Saturdays, uh, lots of Saturday schooling trips, we do a lot of um, excursions, you've got to expose the child to the world that they would be stepping into and exposure is so important. So we've got bus rides out. So many of our kids haven't seen the sea. You know, if they yes. for half a day, they would get to the sea, but they haven't seen the sea. Um, yeah. Yeah. I mean, once you start thinking about that, that's crazy because the Cape Flats is, you know, it's in the middle of the, it's right on the border of Atlantic and the Indian Ocean. It's exactly. right there. It's a sand people, away yeah. from, yeah. <laughs> from yeah, the ocean. Yeah, but people yeah. never go to that. It's amazing. Um, one other thing I read, you did mention it briefly, you were focusing on, on living in the fourth industrial revolution and your, your next sort of teaching, I don't know what you're going to call it, but like emphasis is on the 2030 workplace. 
Um, so how have you adapted that mm. into your, your teaching style? And mm. I think it's important. So if you, um, if you go and Google what did the classroom look like in the first industrial revolution, it's sort of little rows and all the little kiddies sit in a little row and the teacher's writing on the board. Mm. That simulated the, the mechanization of, of labor when, when, when there was mass scale production starting to happen. And that's what happened. So all the accountants sat in a row and all the plants ran with people in a row, um, assembly plants in, of cars, etc. So schools simulated the workplace and then taught into that and never really changed. Up to now, if you walk into most classrooms, they're rows and columns. So a lot of the challenge is to go to workplaces and to say, well, how do you work? Um, work offsite sometimes then, what are we doing to simulate that? Of course, we never got to that. Um, but it was a lot about robotics and coding and providing kids with tablets, doing a lot of things electronically. Mm. as project learning, collaboration. So you look at the skill set that you will require in 2030, which is not just a character skill set of respect and integrity and all of those things. It is a how do we live with each other skill set. Yeah, I think they call it the five C's. Uh, how to think critically, how to collaborate, uh, how to communicate. Just get soft. Yeah. Um, etc. So you do all of those things and then you look at your classroom layout rather than this one size fits all, everybody sits in a row and listen, to do a lot of project work where children can break away. Break away because we work in groups or I don't work in a group, I'm a loner, I want to work on my own or I'm upset today, I want to rather just go and play with soft toys because something mm -hmm. did happen in my home yesterday and to sort of balance that and simulate that level of self-determination that will be in the workplace. Yeah, I mean, the, the, the working environment is so different also, and it's changing so much. And I think now 2020 is a prime example. Uh, a mm -hmm. lot of businesses, um, we've all had to work from home really for a certain amount of time and, and you still need to carry on going. So uh, Zoom, you know, we're on Zoom now, but it, it's become a bit of a pain because uh, Zoom calls end up taking longer and and before you know it half your day is gone oh for uh, sure for sure so it, it really sucks productivity but it is a way to continue to engage with people even though you're sitting at home exactly and i'm i'm not sure that it sucks productivity i think from what uh, from where i'm coming from what had happened uh, i was starting to work from home there was a surge in productivity mm -hmm. we got all zoomed out which kind of simulates almost the interruptions you get in the workplace and other things start happening as well. So it's just a different way of life. But what we had realized is that COVID, rather than being a disruptor, had become an accelerator. Mm. So we are working from home. We all said we should work from home and the world's not changed. I mean, the world has changed a lot, but we're, we're, there's not, you're achieving as much if everybody works from home. So suddenly that's okay. Our kids are studying from home. They were given some cheap tablets, a little bit of a phone and a SIM card and we're on them. Then you've got your timetable. You know when classes are, so just dial in. I've got Mr. Arbil at three and Mr. Sansa at 3.45 and life just continues. So suddenly the kids can be at home. We thought that would be the end of the world for a child to be home. That's fine. So it's lovely. Yeah. Yeah, it just continues. I mean, my daughter's in matric um, and, it, and, and life just continues. You know, I think maybe a bit easier for the matrics because they're quite focused and, and they, they really know that they, <laughs> they have to get stuck, in, stuck into some work. Otherwise, it's going yeah. to be a bit of a disaster. Yeah. But um, it can't have been an easy for, for the kids. Um, and, but I think in time, we'll just get over this little hump, especially from an education point of view. There's no doubt we, that... We, yeah, but to be careful there, yes. And, and in a way, for your daughter, it was rather seamlessly. I, I chatted to Ranagash's pri um, boys primary the other day, and for them it was also rather seamless, and, and, and to a large extent for us. But COVID had shown us the cracks in our society. The digital divide is more real and more invasive than I would have ever thought. You cannot, data is like oxygen. You cannot do without it. And to be able to work from home, you need a stable internet. Sorry, I'm just going to hit stop on this phone call because my mom's phoning me. Oh, and I can't talk to my mom at the moment. <laughs> you have to. I'll talk to my mom. At the <laughs> I'll have to phone her back. But, but you, you, you are right. I mean, there's a, the there's data, a massive divide. 
it's, 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 an, it's an absolute barrier. So for, for us, for example, living in my home, I've got fiber. It costs me a marginal 500 rand, 600 rand a month. And mm. all of us use it as much as we really like. Mm. But if you're in an in a under-resourced space, you're on 3G. So this call already would have cost about 150 rand. Yeah. So, you know, you really, really set up for failure. If you, um, yes. It's a big problem. Uh, we all we all agree. Uh, data is too too expensive if you don't have it unlimited and uncapped. It's, it's yeah. crazy. And so, it's a differentiator you know. and it's a barrier for for those who struggle. Yeah, I hope I hope the big companies decide to change their whole outlook on it. And we don't really want to go and talk about the cell phone companies, but they've made too much money out of us over the last five, 10 years. So it's Play time to time. change. That's for sure. Yeah. Um, one other interesting thing that I, I read in your, your CEO um, review, your year on review was that you had this plan to have a metric uh, pop-up dorm type of experience, uh, which I thought was so cool. Um, and then you really have the kids in house, um, no distractions. And, you know, I'm, I'm sure that would only be really beneficial to them. I mean, that, that's yeah. probably not going to happen now, or are you going to no, try it? No, it's going to happen. Um, I mean, of course, within the regulations of lockdown. So we've had for the last five years, we rented a house five kilometers from school. So every matric major exam, July, um, and then the mocks in December, we had them there for those who needed to be there. And it's just not really a sustainable solution, hence the pop dorms. And literally last week, we submitted our plans to council. So it's to our board, we've got the funding approved, and the plans have now been drawn up. We've got an architect on board, and it's now been submitted to, to council for approval. And when it comes back, we're starting to build. And when it's starting to build, it's going to happen. Um, yeah, so it's all very real, and the plans are, uh, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I was, I was, uh, I've been to the school a couple of times now. Um, the, the walkthrough we did with our Canadian teachers was, was just so great. And yeah. I know from, from their perspective, I mean, they just left with mm -hmm. wide open eyes and, and they were just amazed at, um, at what you've done, yeah. but also in particular, what the, what the kids were like and how engaging mm -hmm. they were. And um, yeah, I saw a lot of thankful, really happy kids, you know, and, and it's, it's so cool to see. Um, so I'm hoping, you know, down the line we can get, yeah, confident. It was really cool. And I think but that's also a sign of what's happening these days. You, know, you walk around this, the high schools and, you know, there's a lot of friendly kids. They very happy to come up and say, hi, can you help? Or can, can, where are you going? Can I help with this and that? It's so mm, great. And it's mm, changed so much mm. in the last 20 years. So yeah, that is yeah, I think, I think I take my hat off to you um, for doing, for doing a job and your whole team for that matter. Really cool. I, I yeah. walked in there today Thank to drop you. off a couple of items for your, for your food drive. A um, drive. Which, yeah, which I believe was successful and, and that's, that's really cool. Um, I think for the internationals mm -hmm. uh, that are watching, maybe I can ask, I can pose the question to you, you know, how, how can they get involved in a school in Cape Town, you know, because they, they obviously can't volunteer time. Um, Financial help is always is is always great, but is there is there any other way that, that we can get these internationals to possibly so help think, the school up? I mean, yeah, I think you've 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 settled that. I mean, clearly, if if they're not here, they can't volunteer. Um, mm. so not in a physical sense, and yes, we are donor reliant, so every penny counts, um, definitely. But a way to get involved other than that is, I think, something that won't benefit us directly, but a way to get involved is to really engage with yourself and your community on what social transformation is and what poverty is and isn't. Um, you've seen the whole upheaval in the United States and internationally on Black Lives Matter. All of that is fishes in society when, where, where no one is even close to equal. So just an awareness of that, I think will help the world. And if the world is helped, we're helped. Um, mm -hmm. A very practical level if one is with a school or an organization etc it really benefits our kids to have connections because that is part of exposure so to be able to partner with another school for example and have friday afternoon zoom sessions or to be able to partner with a couple of international companies and have career sessions with them 
or I'm just looking at your explore more travel. I don't know, somewhere out there is a Jeep in the middle of the wilderness with a camera and to invite our kids in to come for a Land Rover sunset drive to see a yes. life. Yeah. Yeah. That sense of exposure can be electronic. Um, the world is yeah. almost virtual and we, we can step into that. Cool. Now that's good to hear because I certainly have a lot of contacts, you know, through the explore more travel business and Mm -hmm. um, I'm thinking straight away, we need to get the Canadian uh, girls that were coming out on this trip. We need to set up something um, and have a Zoom interaction exactly. conversation with some of your kids. And that will happen. That, yeah. yeah, and they were so um, you know, bitterly disappointed that their trip um, had to cancel because uh, mm -hmm. a lot of them hadn't been uh, to Africa, not South Africa at all. So, yeah, that's, yeah. So that's good to hear. And then I think from a local perspective, yes, um, you know, we're going to send this our first little interview out to as many people as we can. Financial mm, support you. obviously is is crucial to to the school's success, but but volunteering is 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 a much easier way for people that don't have excess funds. So you know I I, exactly. I will I'll put your details out there and all the the, the email addresses and the and the websites people can go and read more and and watch some of your videos, but. I implore people go and volunteer and it's, it yeah. doesn't take a lot of time to make a, a big difference. Um, and then contacts of ours in the business, in the business world, in internships, mm, exactly. you know, the, Thank you. The job placements, or, or just donate your time where you go and talk to people about what industry you're mm. in. I find kids, yes. kids need that, you know, we can go and send them to these tertiary um, institutions, but if they're not uh, actually hearing from business mm -hmm. owners um, about what, their day-to-day -day lives are like, you know, and, and they really are blind to, to what the real world, world is like. So, exactly, exactly, um, yeah. yeah. So I think from my side, it's, it's so cool that we bumped into you and, and Crystal House, and I'm quite excited mm -hmm. to continue our relationship with the school. Um, and uh, yeah, I think, I hope people find this really informative. For me, I think it's amazing. Uh, I think Without education, you know, we're in, we're in trouble. And I find there's so much opportunity within education now in, in South Africa. Um, and I, I foresee some really good years coming up. We just need to get over this little COVID. And, and we will. And we will take the learnings and, and be a new world. So, yeah. So, thank you also for, for having me and for allowing me to just share my enthusiasm with, with, with the hope, hopefulness of it all. No, definitely. So at the end of yeah. this clip, I'm going to um, post a video on, on Crystal House so people can get an idea of the faces and, and what it's all about. Um, yeah. And then if there are any other questions, then you know, please drop us a mail, uh, give me a call uh, or give Audrey's team mm -hmm. a call and, and we, can, we can have more discussions about how you can get involved in, in Crystal House. So good. Audrey, thank you so much again. Um, wishing you a, a, a wonderful weekend. Uh, and I'm looking forward to visiting again. Uh, to the Absolutely. Very soon. Thank you. Thank you, Warren, and good luck to, to everything that you guys are doing as well. We're certainly counting the days. Thank you. Cool. Cheers, Audrey. Right. Bye. Bye. Cheers. I am a business unit trainer at Merchants. I am studying Fine Art at the Michaela School of Fine Art at the University of Cape Town. I graduated with six distinctions and I'm studying a Bachelor of Arts in Social Dynamics at the University of Stellenbosch. We won Provincial Gold at the World Robotics Olympiad in Cape Town. All because of the opportunity I got from Crystal House. Crystal House. Crystal House. I'm 14 years old and I live in a township called Gokuletu, known for its gang violence, poverty and unemployment. My two younger siblings and I live with my grandmother. We rent a one-room shack made of zinc in the backyard of my family. My grandmother provides what she can for us but she does not work and has no pension, so we survive on our child support grants. I don't feel safe in my township. I always worry that something bad might happen to me. I was born into a township with very little opportunity, but I still have dreams of a brighter future.
The South African youth unemployment rate stands at 52%. Without a school leaver certificate, it's extremely difficult to find a job. We at Crystal House South Africa are proud to have 100% pass rate since we started. We offer a no-fee um, scholarship to children of households with a, a maximum income of 1,500 rands per member of the household per month. We support the learners for 18 years, 13 years of which are spent in our junior school and high school, five years in the college and career space. During that time in the high school and the junior school, learners have access to free transport to school, healthy meals, counselling, health care and other related family intervention support. We believe in a holistic intervention and breaking the cycle of poverty by involving the community. For having two children at Crystal House, they are getting the most amazing opportunities that I never had. And we have a huge impact socially as well as economically. We employ over 100 people every day. There are 750 kids running around our high school and our primary school. They've got parents and they've got children and they've got communities that they depend on. And what a privilege to know that Crystal House can wrap its arms directly around over 4,000 people every single day. If you start by building character, the rest will follow. The ultimate differentiator between success and failure is mindset. Now mindset for us is character. But in South Africa we think somehow we've arrived when you write matric, but you don't. You fall into a pit of unemployment. So understanding poverty and understanding how to break the cycle of that poverty works because we've got the numbers to show it. Crystal House has changed my life by helping me plan my path to becoming an environmental chemist. Crystal House has truly transformed my future and that of my community. And I am just one example. By sponsoring a student or a class for the coming year, imagine what we could do together to contribute to the future of South Africa.